it's good to see everybody. And uh, you would turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 11. John, chapter 11, which we entered into a few weeks ago. Um, we were gone last week. Pastor Frank did a great job. And uh, but as we said a couple weeks ago, we, when we entered into John chapter 11, we said it's an important and interesting chapter for a number of reasons. It's important because it contains the last of seven miracles performed by Jesus that John chose to include in his gospel. He did that for a very important reason. He said, you know, there were so many works, miracles that Jesus did that I suppose all the books in the world couldn't contain them. Hyperbole? Probably. But who knows? He said, but I've chosen seven. And we, this comes out of John 20, verses 30 and 31. I've chosen these seven to record in this gospel. That you might, seeing these miracles, understand that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing you might have eternal life in his name. So John was very particular about the Miracles he chose to record in his gospel for a very specific purpose that it was to bring glory to Jesus and that people would believe in him and be saved. Now, the last miracle that John records is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And in my mind, this was the most sensational of all the miracles recorded in the gospel, even though Lazarus wasn't the only one Jesus had raised from the dead. The gospels record at least two others. There may have been more, but there's three recorded in the Gospels altogether. Mark and Luke record that Jesus also raised a 12-year-old girl, the, the daughter of, of Jairus, uh, who was very sick, in fact, died. So that was one of the resurrections. The other was he raised a young man who had died, whose mom was a widow who lived in the village of Nain, N-A-I-N. And of course, her husband was gone. She was a widow. And so her a son was the only one taking care of her. There weren't any social programs back then. So family took care of family. Her husband was gone. And so suddenly her son dies, and uh, who was taking care of her. But Jesus had compassion and went and healed uh, him, uh, excuse me, raised him from the dead. He had died. But what separates those two resurrections from Lazarus' resurrection was that those others, well, these, and I think we would all say that anytime somebody is resurrected from the dead, it's pretty spectacular. But what separated Lazarus' resurrection, even from the other two in the Gospels, was that Jesus raised them shortly after they had died, where with Lazarus, he had been dead and buried for four days before Jesus raised him from the dead, indicating that decay and decomposition had already begun to take place, which in my mind makes his resurrection unique to say the least, but the most sensational of all those that he raised from the dead. But John chapter 11 is also important because along with chapter 12, it forms the bridge of the transition between the close of the public ministry of Jesus and then the final events surrounding his death and resurrection as recorded in chapters 13 through 21. We see in John's gospel, half of his gospel is devoted to the last week of Jesus' life before the cross, and half of that is devoted to the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. John gives us an incredible amount of detail that we don't get from the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because John does focus in so much on the last week, and in particular, the last few hours of Jesus' uh, life before the crucifixion, so where is we get into that, you'll see the detail that John adds, things that we don't get from the other Gospels that are a real blessing for us to know. We'll get to those when we uh, get to those chapters. But uh, I think also, it, chapter 11 is a very important chapter for no other reason. It gives us a basis for understanding why God allows suffering in our lives. And we've been looking at that the last couple of weeks. And uh, it's a truth that a lot of people can't come to terms with. Uh, there's a lot of folks when they hear that God will allow people to suffer, get sick for his glory, they recoil in, in horror uh, that 
uh, that can't be true. They, they feel that uh, they can't deal with that. They, they refuse to believe it's even genuine, a, a, a real thing, that God will allow sickness and suffering for his glory. We've been looking at that the last couple of weeks, and I've broken this chapter down into several main points. And uh, the first one I'm called the critical friend, not critical hearted, critically sick. Okay, let's read verse one. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. We'll study that act of true worship and devotion in chapter 12. But uh, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Verse 3, therefore the sister sent to Jesus saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now again, guys, there are many who believe that God would never and even could never use sickness to glorify himself. However, those who say that really don't know the Bible. I mean, one of the greatest Christians, if not the greatest Christians in the church age was Paul the Apostle. And we read, and I won't have you turn to it, I'll read it to you, 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 10, Paul said that because God gave me so many revelations, uh, Paul wrote most of the New Testament. But Paul said, because God gave me so many revelations, you know, it would have really puffed me up if he hadn't also then sent to me, uh, given me a messenger of Satan to buffet me. He goes on to say, I prayed three times, 2 Corinthians 12, 8. Uh, I, 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 concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul then says, therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities, a Greek word that could mean illnesses and other things, but it could include illnesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God does not want us relying on our own human strength, ingenuity. Sometimes he will allow us to suffer some things, to humble us, to get us to the point where we are trusting totally in him. It's not, the kingdom of God, self-reliance is not what God wants from us. It's total brokenness and dependence on him. That's the only way he can make himself strong to our left, right? Now, upon hearing this, a lot of skeptics, unbelievers would then say, well, if God does use sickness for his glory, then he can't be a God of love. That's where a lot of people are coming from. Anticipating that response, the Holy Spirit quickly adds in verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and their sister and Lazarus. Guys, this whole narrative, as we're going to see, was being set up for the disciples' benefit and for God's glory. God had a purpose in this whole thing, as we're going to see as we progress. But guys, again, God will sometimes use sickness for his glory. And because of it, John adds verse 5 so that we didn't get the wrong impression from this story. That we didn't get the wrong idea that perhaps Jesus didn't care about Lazarus and his sisters. That he was maybe indifferent to this family, what they were going through, and their pain at this moment. In verse 5, John used a different Greek word for love than he did in verse 3. In verse 3... It says, therefore, the sister sent it to him, to Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now, the girls used the Greek word phileo, or I should say that John recorded it in his gospel using the Greek word phileo. It's a word that means to be fond of, to be fond of. It's usually a word used for brotherly love or the affectionate love of close friends for each other. It's a fondness, okay, and so on. But phileo love is an emotional kind of love. It's an emotional kind of love. Again, it's the love of close friends or brothers, sisters for one another. Whereas the word that John uses for love in verse 5 is the verb form of the Greek word agape. Agape. And as Christians, we all know that agape love is most often used in the New Testament for God's love. For God's love. Very important that we understand that the ultimate example of 
the use of agape, for God's love is John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in Jesus would not perish in hell but would have everlasting life. Guys, agape love is not an emotional love. I'm not saying that emotion can't accompany agape love. It is just not an emotional kind of a love. It's a sacrificial love. It loves unconditionally and absolutely. It's the kind of love that Jesus tells us to love our enemies with. An enemy is somebody you don't feel things for. If you don't, you don't feel love for, you feel maybe uh, anger toward or something else. Um, how can we love our enemies? I have no feelings for my enemies. Good feelings, love feelings for my enemies, people say. Well, that's because God's love is not a feeling, it's an action. It's defined in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 by all verbs. Because God's love is not a feeling, it's action. It's action-oriented. God so loved the world that he what? Felt bad for us but moved on? Well, you blew it. I had high hopes for you, but you know, you ate that apple or whatever you ate in the garden there. And that's, that's it. I, I'm going across the universe. I'm going to try again somewhere. Yeah, no. God so loved the world of lost sinners that he what? Gave that agape love in operation. It sees a need and it wants to meet the need. Feelings are irrelevant. I will tell you, if you have an enemy that has a need, Jesus said, meet the need. And if you do meet the need, there's going to be a connection. And you're going to start feeling feelings for a person that was an enemy, but now you're you know, helping out in some way. Now you, you're connected to them. You've got a vested interest in seeing them uh, do well. And, and it causes feelings. But that's not what agape love is. That's the essence of God's love for every one of us on the face of the earth. People think, well, I don't deserve God's love. Of course you don't. I don't. Uh, why would God want to love me? I'm not lovable. doesn't matter. It, he is love. It's not, you're not looking for something in you to love. He's love. 1 John 4, 8. God is love. Doesn't have just a, not just a lot of love. He is love. And so it's his nature to love. Even when we don't deserve it, we blow it. Uh, we don't measure up to some standard we've got in our mind that we have to measure up to before God's going to really love me. He loves you just like you are, just for all you've done, but he wants to make you better. He doesn't want to leave you there. It's because God loves you as a drug addict or alcoholic or, or whatever you might be. It doesn't mean he wants you to stay there. By God's His grace, he wants to lift you out of that. Because that's what love does. It wants to help. It wants to do what we can to make people better. But here's the thing, guys. If God so loved this family, why did he allow Lazarus to get sick in the first place? Let alone die. Well, we're not left to guess. Jesus tells us. It was to bring glory to God. Verse 4. We'll talk more about the concept of bringing God glory next time. Okay? But it's critical that we understand this fact before we progress in the story. That Jesus, you know, the girl said, uh, you're fond of Lazarus, come help him. And the Holy Spirit said, no, Jesus wasn't just fond of his family. He had got at this family. Mm -hmm. He had a deep, deep love for this family. He didn't know that. We weren't told that. As we progressed in the story, we would not realize. I mean, we might think that Jesus didn't care about this family. If the Holy Spirit hadn't made it a point to tell us this in verse 5. I mean, we'd be prone to think from what comes next. That maybe God in general, and Jesus in particular, was indifferent towards Lazarus and his sisters. Didn't care about them. This was the feeling that many in that ancient world, a concept of God that they had, the, the pagans had a concept of the gods. And of course, there was a lot of polytheism back then. So when you're talking about religious pagans, they had, for the most part, a concept of the gods. In fact, they had a word, a Greek word to describe what they believed about the gods. They believed the gods were apatheia. The Greek word we got a word apathetic from. Okay. In other words, they believed that the gods didn't care about human beings, what they were going through. 
uh, didn't care about the suffering uh, of mortals, you know? Um, and if they were going to do something to help people, this is the pagan mindset, uh, there had to be given to these gods, they had to be appeased through bribes and offerings to uh, kind of uh, bribe them, motivate them to do something good for, you know, mortals is the idea. In ancient pagan cultures, human sacrifice was the ultimate offering to secure the gods or a god's favor. We have 2,000 years of Christianity behind us. Put yourself for a moment in the first century and think like a first century pagan. And here comes these Christanians, these Christ followers. Christian was a derogatory term, you realize that. Uh, Christians called themselves people of the way, but the pagans called them Christanians, Jesus followers, Jesus people. It was a put down. Church heard that, go, I kind of like that. Christian. Yeah, we're going to call ourselves Christians. Okay? But here come these Christians into the Greco Roman pagan world, talking about a God that, first of all, didn't have to be appeased to help people because he loved people. Secondly, a God who never at any time ever wanted a human sacrifice to motivate him to do something kind to mortals, human beings. But in fact, it was a God who saw our plight, how that one man, Adam, and his wife Eve, blew it for all of us in that all of their descendants after them were born fallen sinners destined for hell. And here comes the Christians saying, look, our God so loved the world that he came down, became one of us, and died for us. He never wanted people to die for him. He came down and died for us that we might be saved from this horrible place called hell. If you're a pagan living in the first century Greco-Roman world, with your mindset the way it was towards the gods, and you heard about this God, the God of Christianity, you have to know that was, to say it was revolutionary was to not do it justice. And that was one of the ways that God, what God used to draw these people to him. His love for fallen mankind. So we have seen the critical friend, verses 1 to 5, one verse, verse 6, the callous Savior. I say that with tongue in cheek. Verse 6, so when he, Jesus, heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. You gotta get your mind around this. The girl sent an urgent message to Jesus. Lord, come quickly. Your dear friend, you're so fond of him. Lazarus, he's on the verge of death. Jesus hung out two more days. And then makes the two-day journey to Bethany. That doesn't exactly sound like the actions of a dear friend, does it? Warren Worsby said, and I quote, the record makes it clear that there is a strong love relationship between Jesus and this family, yet our Lord's behavior seems to contradict this love. End quote. Guys, we've said this before, please. I think it bears repeating every once in a while because we forget things. We have to know that God loves us based on on what he has said to us in his word, not based on our circumstances. Because our circumstances don't always indicate that God really loves us. And in fact, when we go through difficult times, times of adversity or heartache, or we lose someone we love very dearly and we're crushed in our spirit, if we didn't know that God loves us from his word, and we tried to, from our circumstances, come to the place where we feel God really loves us, our circumstances wouldn't bring us there. Because they're often contrary to what we would think God would do to us before us if we were, if he was really a God of love, a good and kind, loving God. And the devil is right there to use our circumstances, whispering in our ear, if God really loved you, if he was really that loving and good, a good guy. Would he allow you to go through this? I mean, come on, doesn't this prove to you that he's not a good God? He doesn't love you. 
trying to get us to look at the circumstances of our lives, right? Instead of what God has said in his word, like John 3, 16, or I love Jeremiah uh, chapter 29, verse 11, where God says, look, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. You may not always know that. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. They're thoughts of peace, not of evil. I love you. I'm always working for your eternal good. But the circumstances of your life don't always indicate that. You've got to trust me. That I love you no matter what you're going through. Sometimes I've got to allow you to go through things that are very difficult. It's at those times you have to know that I love you. I was telling first service that years ago at a pastor's conference, this is going way back in the 80s, one of our Calvary pastors, whose name is John, got up there and he was uh, teaching. And he was teaching on this subject. And John had gotten married. He's a young man. They had three children. I think the ages were one to three. Uh, and his wife died in a car crash. Now John, as a pastor, has loved to raise three small children on his own. He's a pretty incredible guy. But one day, his uh, three-year-old daughter came down with some kind of a boil on her neck. I don't remember all the details, but I do remember the basics of the story. And uh, so John called the doctor, and the doctor said, bring her in. Only three. The doctor takes one look at this and says, John, this is filled with poison. I've got a lancet. And I'm not sure why he couldn't give her anesthesia, you're going to have to hold her down and have to cut the seam open. Well, John knew that if he didn't, his daughter was going to die. So he grabs onto her tightly, and the doctor starts to cut this thing. Well, this little girl went crazy. She started screaming, no, daddy, no. Please, dad, no, daddy, no. So all she knows is her loving father is allowing someone to hurt her, and she's got no idea why. And she just kept screaming, no, daddy, no, no, daddy, no. And she finally passed out from the pain. Well, he takes her. Of course, as a father, he's devastated. Three weeks later, this thing comes back. Calls the doctor. The doctor says, you'll bring it back in. Now, this time, when he pulls up to the place where the doctor is, you know, is at, she starts takes one look at the building. He starts screaming. Daddy, daddy, no, no, she's screaming. Takes her in, holds her down, doctor cuts this thing open again, got to drain the poison, and she is screaming, daddy, please, please, daddy, no. Then so she passes out from the pain. On the way home, John said, I was so devastated that my God would put me through this with my daughter. And he said, I just began to talk to him. I said, Lord, why? Why did you allow this? And John said, God spoke to him so clearly, not audibly, but more clearly than he's ever spoken to me in the whole time I've been a Christian. He said, John, why did you let your daughter go through that kind of pain? Well, Lord, you know, it was to save her life. That's right. She didn't know that. She's three. All she knew was her, her loving father held her down while somebody hurt her. She had no idea it was for her good. If, if she, you hadn't held her down, the doctor hadn't cut this thing open, she would have died. John, there are times in your life I'm going to have to do some things that you're not going to understand. I'm going to have to put you through experiences that at the moment you can't figure out why. I'm allowing this. Like your little daughter screaming, Daddy, no, Daddy, no. Why, Daddy, why? You're going to have to trust me. There are things in the hearts of my children that I have to get at. Poison that will hinder their walk with me. Their eternal best that I can give them. There are times when I have to put them through trials, adversities, that act like a knife to cut and drain the poison from their system, from their bodies, their hearts. It's at those times, John, you have got to know you can't doubt, you can't wrestle with maybe. You have to know with all your heart more than you know anything in the universe that I love you. 
And whatever pain I allow you to go through is for your own good. That's a pretty powerful story. I've never forgot. Not easy to live, but it's important to understand. Now, again, the background for this chapter, John 11, is that Jesus and his disciples were down by the Jordan, Jordan River near Bethabara, which is about 20 miles from Bethany, which meant it was a two-day journey by foot. Mary and Martha sent an urgent, quote-unquote, prayer request. That's what it was, really. An urgent prayer request to Jesus to come and heal Lazarus, who was seriously ill. So Jesus delayed his coming for a couple of days. Remember this. When it comes to prayer, God's delays are not necessarily God's denials. Uh, you know, there are times when we're praying for something and praying and praying, and God's not answering it because the answer is no. And, and, and he'll show you that eventually. But often it's not no, it's just not yet. You know, I mean, Ecclesiastes 3, 1. For everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. God is a time for everything. And if you're praying for something that's good, like a wife or a husband, if you're a young person, that's a good thing. The Bible even says he who seeks a wife seeks a good thing. Because God's ordained marriage. It's a wonderful thing. If it's done right and lived the way God has created it to be lived, it's a beautiful thing. And so a young person is praying, Christian praying, God, I want a spouse, I want a husband, or I want a wife. That's a good thing, but God's got a time in it. So you just keep praying. You don't give up, as Jesus taught us in the gospel. You keep asking and seeking and knocking in prayer until God either says no or the time has come to give you what he has always wanted to give you, but his timing is always perfect. I will say this to you in all my years of ministry. It's been my experience that God often waits until the situation becomes so dire, so desperate, so beyond any human ability to fix things, that when he does step in and work, it's so miraculous, guess what? He gets all the glory. And that's what he wants. He wants to get glory for the work that he does. And so I have discovered sometimes, not always, but many times, the longer that God waits, the more incredible the answer is going to be when he finally responds. I mean, if Jesus would have gone to Bethany to heal a sick man, he had done that thousands, maybe tens of thousands of times in his three-year ministry. But a guy who was dead and buried for four days? That's going to get some people's attention. So listen to me again. Not even Jesus' love for this family, and he did love them deeply. Mary, Martha, Les, not even his love for this family would force him to act ahead of his father's will. Again, God the Father told Jesus, no doubt, don't go to Bethany immediately. I think that was Jesus' first his inclination was to run to Bethany to help his friend. I'm sure the father had spoken to him and said, no, you wait two days. And probably told him why. Because Jesus does indicate that this is going to bring glory to God, okay? But um, God the Father was working on a divine timetable and Jesus following his Father's will. I remember Mark 1.35, he got up early every day before the sun came up to spend time with his Father. I believe he did that to get instructions for the day. He never did anything on his own, or according to his own will. He submitted everything uh, his whole life in ministry to the Father's will, something that we all need to learn from. We wing it too often, folks. We do our own thing way too often, and then ask God to bless it. Or when it goes south, why did you do this to me, God? Well, I didn't tell you to marry an unbeliever. Oh, but Lord, I, I really believe that you were going to save them. Well, that's what you believe. I didn't tell you that. But I will. You know, often God says, but I'm going to work. It's going to take a while. I'll work. He'll eventually come to me, but you're going to have to hang in there. You're going to have to be you know, the epitome of selfless love. It's going to be hard. The way the transgressor is hard. You know? It's so much better if we do it God's way, right? Don't somebody be problem free. It's just, I'd rather know if, I, if I'm in a situation that's kind of difficult, I'd rather know I'm in it because I was in God's will as opposed to being outside of God's will. 
All right, so we've seen the critical friend, the callous savior, number three. This is as far as we'll get today. The concerned disciple. The concerned disciple. Again, verse six. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to, to the disciples, uh, let us go to Judea again. That's where Jerusalem was. And the disciple, disciple said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews, and when John used the word Jews, he's talking about the Jewish leadership. We know the, 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 the focus was the scribes and the Pharisees. We know that from the previous chapters. Rabbi, lately the you know, scribes and Pharisees, the Jewish leadership, sought to stone you. And you are going there again? You know, Jesus' disciples were rightly concerned about returning to the area of Jerusalem. Remember, Bethany was about two miles from Jerusalem. It was a suburb of Jerusalem. That whole area was really hot in the sense that, you know, they wanted to kill Jesus. Their, their murderous hatred for him had boiled over. Uh, they were looking for him to just pin anything on him to kill him. You want to go back there? Okay. And they said this because of what happened just before they left. Back in John chapter 10, in talking to these scribes and Pharisees, verse 25, they wanted to know, who are you? I told you, you don't believe though. I, I told you who I am. You know, the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness of me, verse 26. But you don't believe because you are not my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. And I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And here's the statement that got them into trouble. I and my Father are one. Whoops. They picked up stones again to kill him. Indicate it wasn't the first time. Okay. So the disciples were rightly concerned. Lord, these guys want to kill you in Jerusalem. You want to go to Bethany, which is right next door? What they did not know, these disciples, was that until the day of Jesus' crucifixion, a time appointed by the Father, no one or nothing was going to hurt the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he responds with a very important truth we all need to take to heart. Verse 9, he answered, there are, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Guys, in that culture, both Jews and Romans divided each day, each 24-hour period, into two parts. 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness. Now, that wasn't always exactly 12 hours for each. But that's how they looked at it, okay? 12 hours of light, 12 hours of darkness. Now, most men worked back then in the daytime. Uh, you know, I mean, and they had some light. You could, at night, light an oil burning lamp, give you some light, but you couldn't do a lot of work by that kind of light. You could take it into your house and maybe have enough light to, to talk and maybe even read, but uh, it wasn't enough light to do a lot of the jobs that they did back then. I mean, it was rigorous stuff. There were ranchers and farmers. and You know, uh, you needed the light of the day, the sunlight, uh, to do the work that most of these people did uh, because they had to see what they were doing, where they were going. Otherwise, you know, uh, depending on the job, they could have hurt themselves pretty badly or killed themselves. That's just a simple point Jesus is making. That, you know, there's only 12 hours of daylight in a day and men do work by that during that time. At night, they can't work. They go home and spend time with their families and go to sleep. Was the idea? Right, pretty simple, straightforward truth. Jesus used simple, straightforward truths. A lot of farming or agricultural illustrations because they all knew that life. But there's always a spiritual application, wasn't there? And there was definitely one here. To this simple idea in the scriptures light and darkness are used quite often as metaphors we've talked about this light is often used in the scriptures to represent spiritual truth holiness moral purity and obedience toward god and darkness is often used in the scriptures to represent spiritual error evil moral impurity and rebellion against god the spiritual application of walking in the light is that it represents walking in obedience to the word of God 
in accordance with the will of God. The day, quote unquote, represents the time in part by other nuances that Jesus intended by saying it. But I believe we talked about the day. It represents the time allotted to each of us by God to live our lives upon the earth. When Jesus said in John 9, 4, work while it is still day, the night is coming when no one can work, he's talking we only have a certain amount of time God has given us on this earth to live and to serve God, bring him glory. The night is coming when no one can work. Probably a reference to death. Okay? But the night represents a person who is not living in obedience to God and his word. Someone who is walking in the darkness. They're not living in obedience uh, to God and his word. But I, I believe also when Jesus talked about the night, it could represent the end of a person's life. And how that the day, quote unquote, of God's grace had come to an end, the day that they could be saved or serve God. The day of God's grace had come to an end, and the night, quote unquote, of judgment was now upon them. Example, Judas Iscariot. You remember in the upper room, we'll see it when we get to that passage or portion of John's Gospel. You remember how that they were all up in the upper room observing the Passover meal, right? The night before Jesus was crucified. And Judas was reclining right behind Jesus. They reclined in threes around the table that sat on the floor on the one side, you know, just topped up on the one side. Well, Judas was behind Jesus. And Jesus began to talk about someone, one of you is going to betray, going to betray me, and they all started to buzz among themselves. Who is it? Who is it? He said, me, is it me? You know, and and uh, Judas leaned over while the whole room is buzzing. They're not really paying attention. He leans over and quietly whispers in Jesus' ear, Rabbi, is it me? And he basically said, you know it's me. What you do, do for me. All of a sudden he gets up and leaves the room. The disciples thought he's going to buy something to pass over me. Right? No, he went out to carry out his betrayal of Christ. And the Holy Spirit adds something that I've always made. He said, after Judas left the room, and it was what? Night. And it was night. Well, of course it was night. Passover didn't start till sundown. The Holy Spirit wasn't stating the obvious. He was saying the day of grace for Judas Iscariot had come to an end. And now it was night. The judgment of God was upon him. The day of grace had ended. He could no longer be saved. He had passed the point of no return. As every human being will do if they don't repent and give their heart to God. While they still have the day quarter of God's grace, the opportunity. The night is coming. The night of physical death, but the night of eternal judgment is coming. Today is the day of salvation, right? Paul didn't say tonight is the, day, is the time of sin. He said today. Today. While you still have the light of God's grace. And so. Author William McDonald adds another idea for understanding Jesus' words. He said, and I quote, the spiritual meaning of the Lord's words is as follows. The Lord Jesus was walking in perfect obedience to the will of his Father. There was thus no danger of his being killed before the appointed time. He would be preserved until his work was done. In a sense, this is true of every believer. If we are walking in fellowship with the Lord and doing his will, there is no power on earth that can kill us before God's appointed time, end quote. Now, of course, the question is, yeah, but I don't know his appointed time. Well, that's a problem. I, I will admit that. But here's what we do. You walk in fellowship with the Lord every day. And that way your life won't be cut short. If you're living in fellowship with the Lord, you will live out the days he has appointed for you and finish the work. We'll always have time to finish the work he's appointed for each of us. If we stay in fellowship, keep close to him. All right, back to verse 11 of John 11 as we bring this to a close. These things he said, at, and after that, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I, that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he's going to get well. 
you know, it was kind of hard on these guys. They weren't spirit filled yet, okay? And so they, a lot of times they just didn't get it, you know? I mean, I think Jesus was patient with them, but you know, uh, let, let's go because we're going to wake up Lazarus. He's sleeping. Well, Lord, if he's sleeping, that's good, right? The guy's sick. When you're sick, you sleep, right? Because that helps. Sometimes I just imagine in my mind's eye, Jesus going, Okay. Uh, three and a half years ago. Uh, no, he's dead. All right, let's just get it out there. All right, no, 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 he's dead. All right. Verse 14, Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there that you may believe. This was all being set up for the disciples' benefit. And God's word. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, well, he said, let us go also go that we may die with him. Now, commentators are divided. Was this a, sin a sincere statement or a sarcastic statement? Was Thomas saying, guys, let's all go with the Lord, because if he dies, we'll all die with him. Or was Thomas being sarcastic? Yeah, let's all go. We can all die. I kind of think it was the latter. Okay. But guys, when Jesus presented Lazarus' death to his disciples asleep, he did it because he wanted to differentiate between the death of a believer from the death of an unbeliever. Something his disciples picked up on, and later Paul, when he got saved, and they embraced this concept and passed it along to the church in their writings. Let me just read to these quick. We're kind of out of time. But remember when Stephen was brought before the Sanhedrin and gave his defense. And at one point, he said a couple things they didn't like, so they began to stone him. And it says in Acts 6, uh, 7, verse 60, Then he knelt, and he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died. But that's the way Luke records it. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 and 14. Paul said, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. That is the rapture. When the rapture happens, the dead in Christ will be rise first. And then we are going to be caught up to meet the Lord here. So those who have died believing in Christ are not lost. They didn't know what happened to these people. They all thought Jesus was coming back so soon, everyone was going to be around when he came to establish the kingdom. And then the older Christians began to die. They thought, well, what happens to these people? Are they lost? And so Paul fires back you know, two letters, in the first Corinthians 15, but primarily 1 Thessalonians, where he talks about this. No, they're not lost. They're going to come to Jesus in the rapture of Right? First, first Corinthians chapter 15 verse 51 Paul said behold I tell you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed again talking about the rapture turn to 2 Corinthians 5 I will read you this passage and then we'll comment briefly and close When, when Paul talks about how Christians sleep in death, he would later elaborate on this idea in places like 2 Corinthians 5 by calling our physical bodies tents that our soul indwells. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, obviously, he's talking about the physical body and then the new glorified body, all right? He likens them to houses because that's where our spirit lives, all right? Uh, the body that you came here today in, okay, is not the real you. The real you is a soul consciousness that lives in that body. Uh, that, that's the thing about this, okay? Our culture has put all the emphasis on the vehicle and neglected the inside, the real person, the soul, right? 
And that's the tragedy. Because, you know, these bodies, uh, you know, uh, they're of the earth. They're going to grow old, die, decay, right? Um, a tent is not a permanent place for you to leave. You take a tent camping for a few days, right? You don't intend to live in a tent. It's not designed for that. Well, these bodies were not designed for our soul to live in for eternity, only for time, right? And so we groan, verse 2, earnestly desiring to be clothed with that holy habitation, or excuse me, heavenly habitation, that, that new glorified body which is of heaven. Verse 3, if indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked, for we are in this tent, for we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Paul said, look, my soul doesn't want to be a disembodied spirit. When this body wears out, my soul moves into a new model, right? Folks, this model that I brought here today is a 68 Volkswagen with 300,000 miles on it. I just barely got here. My things are leaking. You know, I mean, creaking, moaning. Uh, half the time I can't get out of bed. You know, won't start in the morning. I'm waiting for that Ferrari. You know, bring it on, Lord. That glorified body, right? He said, look, we, we're growing for that new model. That, that eternal glorified body, right? Um, we're burdened. Not because we want to be a disembodied spirit, but because we want this mortal life swallowed up in eternal life. We want to get on with the eternal. Verse 5, Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we, were at, while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from these physical bodies to be present with the Lord. Present with the Lord. Paul is saying, guys, that these earthly bodies are tents. And that God has pitched these tents here on the earth for our soul to live in, but temporarily, temporarily, while Jesus is away preparing for us a place in heaven. John 14, verses 2 and 3. But this tent is taken down at the moment of death. What do I mean? My soul moves out. This body is going to wear out. It's a tent. At the time of my death, my soul moves out. The body is placed into the grave where it sleeps, quote unquote. It goes back to the dust of the earth, is the idea, right? Um, when this happens, my soul moves out the moment of death. The moment of death. When my soul moves out, it goes to be the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5 8, right? At the time of the rapture, we receive a permanent structure for our soul to live in. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building. It's a spiritual temple. The Jews carried a tent for God to live in for years before the permanent structure of the temple was built, which God inhabited there. Same for us. We have a tent. It's going to be replaced by some, a new body, Right? And he said that this spiritual temple is from God, a house not made with hands, was eternal in the heavens. When Paul, Paul calls our glorified bodies, which we will inhabit someday, a house not made with hands, what he is saying is our new body, our glorified body that God will give us soon, I believe, uh, will not be made with hands. In other words, it is not going to be of this creation. This body, these physical bodies, were part of the original creation, Genesis 1. But as such, they are not suited for the new creation. Read Revelation 65, verse 17. Revelation 21, verse 1. There is a new creation coming, a new heavens, a new earth. This current creation was good, but man corrupted it with sin. It's going to be replaced. God's not going to patch it up. He's going to redo it. He's going to destroy this present creation and give a, a brand new creation, new heaven, new earth, new body, right? Because this body was not designed for heaven. It was designed for the earth. It's of the earth. It's going to return back 
to the dust of the earth. It would be like God saying to us, okay, guys, I want you to spend all eternity living in the ocean. Now, he could give us all, you know, what do you, uh, suits? What is it? One of my mind was like, uh, you know, what is it? Wet suits are actually the, the scuba gear and the, you know, and the, the whole diving suit to wear in the ocean because that's not the environment this body was created for. If I'm going to live there, I have to have a, something that will, you know, or God can say, oh, I'll just give you a new body that's suited for the ocean. He does that with heaven. I've given you a body for earth. If, you want to, if I'm going to take you to heaven, I either got to retrofit you with some kind of a new suit that you're going to live in, or I'm going to give you a new body. It's just easier. And that's what he's going to do, right? Our glorified bodies are going to be specifically designed by God for that new heavenly environment. All right, let's read one more scripture real close. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. Thank you for your patience. 1 Corinthians 15, we'll just read verses 50 to 54. Is Paul's talking about this, how that God has got a new model for us, our soul living. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This physical body is not designed for heaven. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. These bodies were not designed for eternity. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep in death, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will, rise, will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has, been, has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. There is coming a day when the Lord is going to give us those new bodies. The trumpet sounding, the rapture. That's what he's talking about. And uh, when the trumpet shall, uh, sounds, the angel shouts, and we hear Jesus say, come up here, instantaneously we will get our glorified bodies. And we will never be apart from him ever again. And But until that time, those who die in Christ sleep. Now let me just say this as we set it up for next week. We won't spend the whole time talking about this, but I didn't get to it this morning. Um, when we talk, or the Bible talks about the concept of a believer in Jesus when they die, they sleep. This has spawned a false doctrine called soul sleep. It's a heresy. Uh, and since Jesus brought up this idea of a believer sleeping in death, I want to spend just a little time talking about this idea of soul sleep. Uh, it is not biblical, but there are Christians who have embraced it, and we'll talk briefly about it next time as we progress then in chapter 11. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word is truth. We thank you, Lord, that in your word you've given us everything we need for life and godliness. Give us grace, Lord, to keep our eyes on the word and to learn everything about you that we learn from the word and not from our circumstances. Lord, bless these studies. Continue to, to pour your spirit upon them, hopefully, that you'd be glorified we would grow. Lord, we thank you. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.